let's go for it. Good afternoon, Raymond. How are you? Hey, Nick. I'm well, man. Very well, thank you. Excellent. Standing up uh, under the bear, is this? Yeah, the the season of business unusual. It's uh, it's it's quite interesting to say the least. So anyway, I'm looking forward to a good conversation with you this afternoon, my friend, as we track through some of the developments around COVID-19 legislation, particularly around health and safety. And to anybody who has logged in for the webinar, you're welcome to ask questions at any particular time. And, and just to calibrate everybody, Raymond and I did chat at the beginning of the meeting just around, I think all of us would be happy to see the, the back end of COVID-19 and we are all saturated with information. So what we're going to do during this webinar is to focus on some of the key issues for any organization and what you need to consider. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And then we can jump into the issue. So what I wanted to do here is to start off with the legislation and say there's there's obviously a lot of legislation <clears throat> excuse me that's out there at the moment but the two key ones that we're driven by is obviously the risk adjusted strategy and then also the directives that have been issued by the department of labor so the the final covid directive obviously we're informed by the occupational health and safety act but uh, i just wanted to touch on these so this is the guiding legislation with regards to the development of your covid plans and covid risk assessments and without wanting to scare anybody to death, <clears throat> each organization is going to need to consider the fact that it needs to do a COVID risk assessment. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw up one that we've developed that's on the screen. And please don't let it um, scare you. But I want to take you through some of the fundamentals um, from a risk assessment perspective. Something that any organization should consider is that they've identified the various different areas within their organization. So from people accessing the site to the various different areas, office, canteen, warehouse, stores, workshop, whatever it may be. And then within there, you should also consider what are some of the key occupations or functions that are going to take place within that particular area. So obviously site access, you're dealing with security, you're dealing with the receptionist, office admin. Now, here's where we can maybe remove some of the complexity away from the discussion and say well within the office admin area within an administration area you're going to have a lot of different positions you may have a, a clerical position and a manager and a supervisor but ultimately the risk profile for any of those particular people could to a greater or lesser extent be very similar so i'm not going to drill down to the level of detail within a common area where the functionality is very very much the same so again look at the areas look at the occupations. Obviously, the hazard that we're dealing with is COVID-19. We're focusing predominantly on the health risk assessment. Unwanted event is obviously COVID-19 infection, what the consequences of that are. So just maybe to allude to the fact that in creating this risk assessment, I have utilized a, um, a framework which is common to ISO 31000. So they speak about hazard or risk identification, they speak about risk analysis, they speak about the understanding of the control, risk analysis, risk evaluation, and then risk treatment. So, so far we've identified the activity, the area, the hazard, what's the unwanted event, the consequence of that. Has there been or have there been any incidents in that particular area? And then something to consider for a risk assessment is what is the level of exposure? Now, that is, what how populated is that particular area how many people now i a lot of some risk assessment practitioners look at uh, severity likelihood and frequency and exposure all as a cube when they're estimating risk i just prefer to stick to severity and likelihood so what we've done in this risk assessment <clears throat> and i've got a risk matrix for it is we've just looked at the severity and this is pure risk this is uncontrolled risk What's the expected severity, uncontrolled expected likelihood? And then what we've done is we've gone into what we call the hierarchy of controls. So the hierarchy of controls for addressing risk is eliminate, substitute, engineering, technology, administrative, and PPE. So for each one here, if I, and I'm, only, I'm not going to go through the entire risk assessment. This is just to calibrate everybody to show you about some of the thought process that we have around this. So site access, the security guard. Now, in my mind, 
one of the persons on your site that is probably the most at risk is going to be the poor guy at the front of the organization that's paid three and a half grand a month is the security guard. Now, the reason being is he's the poor guy who draw the sh drew the short stick and he's going to be taking everybody's temperature on the way in. Um, in some cases, it may be a, a higher level of management within the organization, but the security guard is taking somebody's temperature and then acting on behalf of the employer to screen for COVID symptoms. And I sent a short note out this week to say, no, the COVID director from the Department of Employment and Labor said that the employer has to screen for observable symptoms. But you're in observing for, in, in screening for symptoms, some of them are observable. Um, is the person coughing? Obviously, this is why lots of these little uh, temperature um, infrared non-contact thermometers have come out because you know, um, observing a person's temperature is very subjective. That's why you want to introduce one of these and to be able to take the person's temperature. But then the questionnaire is then gonna to have to come in as to um, <clears throat> do you have a sore throat, fatigue, diarrhea, and some of the other um, issues. So when we're looking at the poor security guard, some of the things that we can do to reduce the risk there is obviously social distancing around the gate, reduce staff numbers and reduce staff times. And um, we were, busy on a construction project today that is looking at resuming operations because there are some critical issues. There's a potential collapsing bank. Now we've got a, we've then set up literally a hundred meters at the front gate with stakes at the ground every one and a half meters so that when the 50 or 60 construction workers pitch up, they're not all standing on top of each other. We've then got to like the military, get them into a line next to their little peg and get them used to the way that business needs to be done right now. So social distancing, reducing staff um, working times is in the time that they, they start. It's, it's a bit pointless that all 300 of your employees pitch up at eight o'clock, stagger them eight, quarter past eight, half past, et cetera, so that they're not all sitting at your front gate at the same time. So some of the engineering or technology measures you can introduce there is some companies are using screens or barriers when they're taking temperatures and talking to people, obviously to minimize the, the potential of airborne infection, thermometers, administrative controls. So you've got your COVID protocol, your site access, SOPs, hygiene protocols, quarantine protocols. So what happens, something for you to consider, what happens if security takes somebody's temperature and they are over 38 degrees, what now? So uh, a, a company that hasn't thought this through will go, oh, you're over 38 degrees, you can't come in. And now the poor guy or lady is panicking and doesn't know what to do. So each, each employer is need to, going to come up with or need to come up with a, what, what to do, quarantine protocol. So the, the directive says that you need to quarantine the person, give them an FFP1 mask. Personally, I don't agree with the Department of Employment and Labor on that, on that particular statement that they've said an FFP1 mask because that's basically just a dusk mask. So, but anyway, that, that was their directive. And then some of the PPE you should be considering for um, particularly the security guard in this instance is a face shield, KN95 respirator, sanitizer, and obviously personal hygiene. Now the column that I've put over here is to define- Sorry, Nick, can I jump in there? Yo, go for it. Um, just on, on somebody who's over 38 degrees. Yes. Um, you said that the labor director says that they need to be given a mask, that what you refer to as a dust mask, correct? Yeah. What about having a space for them to, to wait? Is a second test administered? What do you do? Do you send them home yeah. after a while? What is the protocol? Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you an example from probably one of my most front-footed clients, which is um, Barrows. Uh, lovely organization, great bunch of guys, very um, great compliance culture that they have within the organization. And what they've done is that if a person is scanned by the security guard as over 38, the person then goes through to the on-site occupational health nurse where the person sits quietly in the office, which is obviously, they've got a waiting room actually, where they, they sit there in the waiting room, they uh, are in a quiet, cool place so they can cool down. Say somebody got off public transport and had to run to work because they were worried that they were late. Now obviously their temperature is sampled again a couple of times over the next 15 minutes. After that, if they are still found to have what looks like a fever and they are demonstrating some of the symptoms, that it then kicks into a counseling protocol where they are then told exactly what they should do next. NRCD is, is informed, Department of Health, et cetera, et cetera. So that should be, but I mean, it, that's easy to deploy in a, an industrial fixed factory 
kind of uh, context. A construction project in the middle of the sticks where the security guard is, is taking the temperature and yeah, you can fill in the blanks around that one. Especially, I mean, look at it from, and let's talk practically around here, look at it from the employer's perspective. If, if that guy even steps foot onto site, the employer is now concerned that their site that they've now waited for two months to open up is now going to get closed down. So I, I think there's going to be some very interesting conversations over the next period. So again, good planning prevents poor performance. So I would, I would consider having protocol. Each organization must consider what they're going to do. Now, let's just talk about, and I don't want to spend too much time on here. Let's just talk about control hierarchies and what they influence. When we look at a control, each control has a particular influence on risk. I'll give you an example of a hard hat. If you go into a construction site and you're wearing a hard hat, a hard hat doesn't stop the brick from falling, but what it does do is stop it from crashing your head if it does fall. So it doesn't limit the likelihood of the unwanted event occurring, but what it does do is it has a significant impact on the severity of the unwanted event. So why I, I speak about that is that when we, we list all these controls that we're gonna put in place, we need to consider what that particular control influences. Majority, if not all of the controls over here are likelihood-based controls. The only control that we could possibly think of if it was introduced would be a vaccine, either a vaccine or some type of protocol that reduces the severity of COVID-19. So again, I'm, I, I know this is a little bit higher order than most risk assessments that you're going to find, but it's, it's nice for people to be able to see kind of the full gospel and then they can then trim it down to um, whichever um, type of technique they want to use. So I look at the control hierarchies and the reason that I stipulate that is quite often when I evaluate a risk assessment, when we get back to the remaining columns, the, the employer has only listed a control type that influences likelihood, but when you get down here, they'll start changing the severity factor. And you can't do that because there's nothing that influences the severity. So that's why you can see here, I've left the severities exactly the same. The only factor that's been changed in the risk um, estimation is the likelihood, because that's all that we're throwing into the pot is likelihood-based controls. Then what the risk management decision is going to be, now again, this would be above my pay grade, once I present the risk assessment to management, they must make a decision with regards to what they intend to do with the risk estimation outcome, and then what additional treatment is going to be given. So anything on this line over here in risk treatment, that's the stuff that's probably going to have an impact on the severity. So as an overview, that's what your risk assessment should look like, and it should consider all the different areas and the occupations and what, what, what within there. Now, what I would like to highlight to these last couple of lines, is any organization needs to consider the fact of what they have control over and what they don't have control over. The biggest risks I believe to most organizations are going to be this. You have control over your organization, your hygiene protocol, who gets in and who gets out. Public transport, you don't. So there's a good chance that if one of your employees gets infected, it's probably going to occur outside of the work environment. Now, Raymond, I'm gonna pitch this ball into your environment and just say, let's consider the following. If I was an employee getting paid a couple of thousand rand a month, I would make it my uh, life's work to ensure that, this, that if I was identified as being COVID infected, that this happened at work. Because then under COID, it's a COID claim, I'm then entitled to the best treatment that money can buy. That's true. Um we haven't seen how this is going to be dealt with yet. I, I, one of the conversations I'm having a lot of with various clients is the problem of causation. How, how on earth can you make a determination of where the infection took place? No, and you can't. And, and, and I share your view that, that if people are using public transport and coming from an uncontrolled environment where, where there might be several people living in the same home where we have no control over the extent to which social distancing is, is being um, followed, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to tell. And, and I think that it's that um, the approach is going to be from the compensation commissioner to, to place the onus, and we don't know yet, but to place the onus on the employer to demonstrate why I came to the conclusion that the infection arose at work. Yeah. Because it's, 
it's the least likely place in some respects. Um, I'm not sure. So let me just kick this back in terms of the COID Act, and just so that anybody who's listening in is clear on this. If an employee comes to you and says, I'm COVID positive, and I believe I caught this at work, you as the employer do not have the right to repudiate the employee's claim to compensation. That's you correct. have to then inform the compensation commissioner of the fact, you are obliged to report it, you can obviously then substantiate all of your claims as to why you think it didn't happen at work. And it is up to the compensation commissioner to decide. And just please bear in mind that you can be fined extensively if you deny the employee right to compensation. So anyway, I hope yeah. that you haven't found that overly, um, overly information intensive, but I thought I would show you kind of a picture of the stuff that we're developing at the moment. So that would be an example of a COVID risk assessment for an organization. Now, the COVID risk assessment should then inform the development of a COVID plan or a COVID protocol, as I've said in this one. And guys, this document is sitting oh, it's kind of 20 pages. I think this is the condensed version. This one's sitting at 20 pages, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I will talk around the critical elements. And one of the things why I put this diagram in is for any organization to effectively control or prevent COVID infection, they have to consider not just their own working environment, but where people are coming from. Those areas over which they don't have control, but which they have influence over. So an employee who's coming to work, are they coming in their own transport? Is it public transport? That's why the government has now gone a further step and said, we want you to provide two masks to your employee. And then there's a big debate going on around who should be washing and whether they should be washing clothes. Raymond, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I do. Just want to confirm, just for the sake of consistency in, in the use of terms, is this protocol, um, the workplace plan, is referred to in the directive? Yep. Yep. Perfect, thank 100%. you. 100%. <clears throat> so you've got your employees who are coming in, you've got your visitors, suppliers, and contractors who are coming in, you've got your own business work environment, you've got deliveries that are possibly being made by your organization, and you've got waste that is going out. These are some of the contact points or the inputs and outputs to your organization, apart from the things that you need to control on your own. So you've got to, and just in terms of tracking, let's talk about that. You've got to have a list of all the people who are entering your organization, who they are and where they come from. That's for your own employees, your visitors, suppliers and contractors as well. And now <clears throat> maybe Raymond, from an HR perspective, something that I know that is causing consternation with a lot of organizations is they've now, had to disable their biometric systems. So you've got your time and attendance yes. and you're logging in, you've now got a, a, a form that's been filled in. And please, um, to anybody who's listening, something that I've seen that I believe is a fatal error by some organizations that I've gone around to is that you pitch up to the gate and somebody hands you a clipboard and a pen and you've got to fill in your name. Yeah. I mean, this is cross-contamination waiting to happen. I'm sure the security guard can write down yeah. my name, my ID number, I telephone, take my temperature and write down the details. I mean, by the end of that day, a hundred people could have come into contact with that clipboard and, and, um, and pen. And there's a couple of actions in my car between me touching that, touching the car, getting the sanitizer out, sanitizing, and then, you know, it's, oh, it's a nightmare waiting to happen. So just in terms of our COVID protocol, um, obviously we've put together an introduction and I think something, in the discussions that I've had with organizations, my suggestion to any organization is, I think my company has developed a reputation for being prudent but practical when it comes to an understanding of risk. We, we try our very best not to be drama queens, which is an unfortunate tendency of the, the um, kind of category of work that we work in. But when we look at this particular issue, we consider the following. The outcome of an exposure can have a fundamental impact, not just on the health and safety of your own workers, but on the sustainability of the organization. Now, I give an example. There were two spas up here in Belito, where I live, that um, had COVID infections. And the businesses were closed down. I think they were closed down. Sorry, yeah, it was one of the checkers and, and the spa were closed down for seven days. 
Now I have to note, guys, at the beginning of, of the lockdown, I walked into many of these shops and the workers were working with no form of protection, no masks were provided, nothing. I would love to know what the cost of business closure was for those shops for seven days versus the cost of what it would have been to provide their employees with suitable protection. So you have to ask yourself in your organization, when you're considering your appetite for risk and what you're going to do within this plan, you've got to consider what the cost is of your employee's health and what the cost of business closure is for you. Because a lot of organizations that I've seen are taking shortcuts with regards to their protocol, which I believe is creating massive risk. And we err more towards the prudent and practical approach rather than the drama queen approach. But here, I believe the risk, reputational, business closure, and employee health is significant. Okay, so I'm not going to go into understanding the virus. I think we could all do a master's degree in what COVID is all about. But one of the things that we've included in our um, COVID protocol is the applicable legislation. And I think it's important because organizations need to, need to understand that it's not Nick said so or somebody else said so. Everything that's in here is because the legislation requires it. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act is relevant, the COID Act, General Administrative Regulations, because that deals with the reporting of incidents, the investigating of incidents, General Safety Regulations deals with PPE and first aid, hazardous biological agents, obviously, construction regulations where construction work is performed, environmental regulations for workplaces because of ventilation and housekeeping, general machinery regulations, driven machinery regulations because people are using tools and equipment within the workplace. Now, National Environmental Waste Management Act. I had a discussion with an environmental attorney last week because we were talking about the disposal of PPE. So with all the guys who are wearing masks and disposing of masks, I said, even if there hasn't been a diagnosed COVID case on the site, would PPE be considered as hazardous waste? And the environmental attorney said, absolutely yes. So there's going to be some interesting considerations, particularly when I go and audit construction sites as to how people are handling their waste. One of the things that we're actually busy developing at the moment is boxes with UVC lights in because we use masks and I think a single use mask is, is a luxury. But if I'm not working in a medical setting and I can sit, uh, stick my KN95 mask into a box with UVC lights, which will kill any virus or germ within 60 seconds of exposure, I'm quite happy to stick my mask in there in the evening. Okay, National Disaster Management Act, Risk Adjusted Strategy, and obviously the COVID Directive. In my plan, I've spoken about how the risk assessment is going to be done. Now, this is a key part. Every organization should take it upon themselves to identify who the vulnerable people are. And, you know, I digress a little bit. If I have a look at, and my, my, my wife who works within the medical uh, fraternity, so it's quite interesting, but if you have a look at the number of deaths that have all been ring-fenced around COVID, and it said it's an interesting discussion that every year, so many people die of flu, but in the majority of cases, it's the comorbidity that the person had, which is the underlying health issue that resulted in the death. So flu obviously just worsened the, the comorbidity and the person died. But on an annual basis, when a person dies, they generally link the death to the comorbidity, not to the flu. But here, obviously, they're linking everything in terms of the fatalities more to the COVID side than the comorbidity. And I would actually love to know with the transparency on those stats of how many people who have died had comorbidity and some underlying um, health factors. So you must take it upon yourself as an employer to identify any vulnerable persons within your organization, chronic lung disease, heart conditions, immune compromised, diabetes, et cetera. You must identify them and make some form of consideration as to how they're going to work, whether are they actually even going to be able to come into work or not. Now, something that a lot of people have not incorporated into their COVID plans, but I have, is working from home, not by virtue of a, um, a COVID exposure perspective, but now your entire workforce that used to sit in your office is now scattered to all of their homework environments and you need to consider the safety of the people when they're working at home, which doesn't normally fall into your kind of standard operating procedures. So you need to consider self-isolation and working at home safely. And, you know, I'm not going to take a shredder from work and bring it home because my kids are going to stick something in it. You know, what's exactly what's going to happen. The home work environment to making sure that it's safe. Office equipment that's now been taken home. And it's quite an interesting discussion to now think, how, where does the liability now rest? 
You know, I'm now working. I'm not at my standard workplace. This place that I'm working, which is at my house, is this is a workplace. The, the equipment is provided by the employer. Where does the liability rest for the safety and the ongoing safety of the equipment that's been provided to me and the safety of the work environment? And I'm not for a minute advocating that we need to put up chevron tape around our houses and I could wrap my kids up in chevron tape sometimes, but suffice it to say, we need to, we need to consider the home work environment, electrical safety, transporting equipment, mental well-being of employees when they're at home because now we're, we're made for community, we're made for connection, and now you've got people who are now scattered to far-flung regions of, of the country who are trying to work in very trying conditions. You've got homeschool environments in the adjacent corridor where mums are trying their best to school kids and find a cure to COVID at the same time. Okay, travel to work. So travel to the site, um, how to protect your employees. Now remember, that if your, your employee brings COVID onto your site, there's a good chance you'll now have, you might have to shut it down or shut down a particular area to sanitize. So my suggestion to any employer is go the extra step, ladies and gentlemen, like quite a few of our clients have done, provide little sanitizer dispensers to your employees so that they've got it for going home in the home environment and coming back to work. That 15 or 20 rand bottle of sanitizer may, call, may save you a couple of minute, million in terms of business closure. Site access and egress is obviously the common hot topic, how people get onto site, what's going to be your kind of protocol around identifying temperatures and quarantine and, and, and. So we've written a kind of an extensive process around uh, site access and egress. Work activity. So obviously social distancing is, is now the, the new topic of conversation. Avoiding uh, close work, general principles around that site meetings. A lot of the organizations that we've been working with, like we're on Zoom now, are working online. Even if they're in the same office, guys will still do online meetings. And here's where I just unpack the, in, in more detail the company's approach to elimination and substitution, what engineering control should be in place. One of the things that's in the DOEL directive as well is the, the duty for the employer to increase ventilation within the workplace, increase the airflow volume, and or the filtration capability, if the organization has any, of the air that people are breathing in. So those are just some of the engineering controls. Administrative controls are all your risk assessments and your plans and your training. Something that I'd just like to add in here, and we've had quite lengthy discussions around this. There are two appointments as such that are required by the two sets of legislation. There is a COVID compliance officer that is required to oversee the implementation of the plan and to ensure suitable hygiene. And then you've also got an information manager to address employee or workplace representative concerns and communicate information about COVID. So some of the administrative controls, you're obviously gonna to have to update your safe work practices to include COVID. Now, here's an interesting one. And I'll add this in a little bit later. Sanitizer, ladies and gentlemen, is 70 or 80% alcohol. Please don't be issuing out bottles of sanitizer to people who are going to be doing hot work like welding or grinding. Sanitizer on the hands, sparks, and we all know where that goes. Um, the employer's duty for medical screening as well and what needs to take place. And please don't forget for a minute that despite the fact that the employer has obligations, the employee has obligations as well. Obviously, Section 8 of the Act deals with the duties of the employer. Section 14 of the Act deals with the, the workers' obligations as such. So personal protective equipment, which is my personal hobby horse at the moment with regards to respirators, etc. So my conversation normally evolves around the following. I support government's suggestion for cloth masks, particularly in a non-workplace environment. It's the best thing that the man in the street can afford. However, and I'm very grateful that the DOEL directive said that the employer has to consider risk and appropriate PPE. Remember the cloth masks um, that people are making. You've got every auntie and uncle around the corner that are making cloth masks. There is a very, 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 very small chance that anybody has done any scientific testing on these cloth masks and their suitability. All that a cloth mask really does is to prevent the distance that the exhaled breath can travel with any droplets of potentially COVID-infected um, saliva um, carried along the air. So it just re reduces the distance. 
there is no proven or scientific testing facts for the filtration capability of a cloth mask. That's why when we work in an occupational environment, we're dealing with FFP1s, FFP2s, FFP3s. And maybe just to talk around that, a lot of people have been asking questions around what's the difference between an N95, a KN95, an FFP1, FFP2, etc. So what it deals with there is three continents. N95, America has the standard N95, and any mask that is rated N95 has been scientifically tested to remove 80, 95% of fumes, vapors from the air. KN95 is the, exactly the same standard, but for China, and the FFP2, again, is exactly the same standard, but for Europe. So all of those, N95, KN95, FFP2, have all been scientific, if it's rated that, have all been scientifically tested to remove that factor or concentration of vapors, dusts, et cetera, from the air. FFP3 respirators, by the way, are 99%, have been tested for 99% effectiveness. So I, cloth masks outside of the work environment, happy days, I don't have a problem with that, but within a work environment, I would suggest three-ply surgical masks, and or KN95s. N95s, KN95, FFP2 for high risk occupations. <clears throat> the security guard, the receptionist, anybody who's regularly dealing with members of the public, your delivery teams, security guards, et cetera, supervisors who are uh, connecting with people in and around the work environment. Raymond, did you want to add anything in there? Sorry, can I, can I jump in with a question there? Go for what it. about schools? What about PPE for students and oh. teachers? I have to say, I was quite dismayed the other day where I, I approached one of the schools, um, I approached one of the schools, let's leave it at that, and said, hey guys, these are the services that we provide and this is what we can offer you. A couple of days later, I saw it advertised on Facebook where they were advertising a cloth mask, a cloth face mask, which they then claimed had 95% suitability at removing whatever and i was I, I was quite tempted to say hey guys please kind of see a copy of the test report because any of the ppe that i've seen imported or that we've bought in has a ce mark fda approval has comprehensive test results to substantiate that the interesting question there raymond for me is is not necessarily or it for me the question with schools is going to be around usability and i have i have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old as much as I would have my kids in bubble wrap and KN95s and full face shields to go to school, the usability of that is not practical. So I think even for schools, as, as much as I may not be a great fan of them, I think even if you are going to go that far is one of those little face shields, because I think inhibiting a child from um, being able to breathe or talk during class, I think a face shield is probably a more practical step albeit maybe not the most effective, but I think it's a good, a good point for discussion. Is that going to be sufficient for teachers considering they're doing most of the talking and most of the spraying? Yeah, so for, for teachers now, again, here is where, and actually I don't spare, could I ask you a favor? Could you pop down at the front desk? There's a KN95 right at the, the door on the table down there if you can grab one for me. <clears throat> With any of these PPE, you have to consider the usability of it. Now, I mean, if I look at a, a cloth mask, so some poor person's got a cloth mask on and they've got this around their face. But the, the problem with the cloth mask is they're not designed to give you an environment like an FFP2 or a K95 has got an extended mouthpiece or a dome in front of it where it actually gives you room to breathe and room to be able to talk versus this, you know, bandit suit that um, some guys are wearing and I'll, I'll have a K95 back with me in a minute. I've got a whole load of them downstairs. So yeah, I would suggest for, for any of the teachers for their own protection, because remember that the kids, if you have a look at the science behind it, the kids seem to be relatively asymptomatic. They may carry it, but demonstrate very, very few of the symptoms or the illness. So they can quite easily be the little germ carriers that they can be. So here is a K95. You can see uh, the problem is it's, is it's white. If I pop this on, the benefit of that is I've got this whole dome piece in the front that allows me room for me to breathe 
and any of the air that I breathe in is coming through this filtration system as it pushes up against the side of my face. And I can breathe quite happily, talk quite happily, pull tongues at you behind here and do whatever it is that I need to do. Cloth masks, on the other hand, don't necessarily allow that. And yeah, I think, I think one of the big, the big concerns for me, which is required by the DOEL directive, is the, the washing of face masks. So, all right, let's take one of my construction sites, for instance. Now, you've now bought 200 cloth masks. They're all going into a washing machine. How do you know that you're getting your face mask back? Do you want somebody else's face mask? Are we just going to wash these and everybody gets back a face mask? Yeah. So, yeah, I think the kids' discussion is going to be interesting. For teachers, I would suggest three-ply surgical as a minimum. N95, KN95, FFP2. And, and again, one of, one of the reasons why I like the KN95 is the FFP2 as a dome mask pushes up against the sides of your face. So it leaves you, if you have a look at the doctors that have been working around this for a long time, they've got an imprint where the mask is sitting. The benefit of this is this sits on the, the side of your face and doesn't necessarily leave the same mark. But anyway, that, that's my concern around cloth masks versus and, and here would be an interesting point. You know, if there is a COVID infection on site and the employer then has to substantiate that they've done everything reasonably practicable to prevent that infection from taking place, I don't, I don't buy the argument of cloth masks in an occupational environment because there's no proven filtration capability. This has been scientifically tested to filter out 95% of all particulate matter. The, the other, on the hand, has got no scientific testing whatsoever. One of the things that is important to understand as well is that whenever you issue personal protective equipment to a person, you have to train them in the care use and limitation of the PPE and also how to look after it and clean it. Remember that with any of these um, respirators that are made of um, a blow molded uh, fabric and multiple layers is you can't clean these with chemicals. So that's why we've got um, UVC light to be able to clean them with, which will kill any germs and viruses. So care use and delimitation of PPE, pre-use checks before you put them on. And again, I was quite interested to watch a doctor and they had the right protocol the other day. Sanitize, take out a mask, put it on. You're obviously wearing it for however long before you take it off. Sanitize, take it off, clean it. So what a lot of people don't do is that second part of sanitizing before you take it off. Pre-use checks on, on any PPE. And in our plan, I've just put in a, a picture here of how to put on a respirator. I've spoken in detail about cloth masks and what people should consider with them. Site hygiene, sanitizer, hand washing. Um, so both of them are obviously effective. I have concern about the flammability. Now let's talk about this. So if you've got an organization with 300 people and everybody's got hand sanitizer on, there's a good chance that you're going to need a couple of drums of or 250 liter drums of sanitizer. Uh, I had a, a client who asked me the other day, they would like a thousand liter flow bin of sanitizer. So that's fine, but you also need to consider when you look at the Itequeni municipal bylaws, once you go over a thousand liters of class three flammable substance, you now need a flammable liquid permit and it has to be then stored in a, a flammable liquid store, et cetera. So you've got to take cognizance of this very, very flammable stuff that you're now bringing onto your site and where you're going to leave it and decant it and dispense it. Hand washing, I've incorporated into here. So the how to sing happy birthday to yourself twice to make up the 20 seconds that you should be taking to wash your hands. Toilet facilities. Now, any employer must take cognizance of the following. I think if COVID infection is going to take place, it's going to be it's going to take place in majority of instances where somebody has touched something, they've had it on their hands, somebody else touches something, and like we all do as human beings is touch your face continually during the course of the day. We need to identify those high risk touch points, um, lift buttons, stairwell um, uh, balustrades, uh, toilet door handles, any of those things that are uh, going to come into contact with people regularly. Something that we're looking at importing from China um, by next week is a little portable handheld 
um, UV wand. So it's got three LED UVCs underneath and you can actually turn it on. It's, um, it plugs into a USB port and you can take it and clean your laptop, your phone, and your mask on an individual level. Because put it this way, you've got all these things that people are touching, but I mean, you're not gonna be putting sanitizer or surface disinfectant on your PC. So that's where you wanna be able to have something where you know that you can sanitize those types of um, pieces of equipment or PPE without utilizing chemicals. So cleaning and those, all those high-risk touch points. And again, canteens, my suggestion to organizations at the moment just would be because of the risk is that I would close down any common eating areas as it is right now. I'd close them down and people should bring their own lunch to work. Obviously, this is a quandary where meals are provided by the employer for the workers. But again, disposable utensils, disposable containers, uh, mixed eating times, uh, significant distance of separation or social distancing when in the eating area, et cetera. It's not an easy one. And I'm, I'm quite concerned about common eating areas. Even if you have a look at the construction regulations, it requires the employer to provide sheltered um, eating areas for workers. But I mean, most of what a lot of construction people do is all the guys go and sit in the container and have lunch. You now you can't do that because of COVID. So you're gonna to have to have guys scattered around the site underneath trees and tarpaulins and shade cloth to be able to eat their lunch. Changing and, and shower facilities again is, I mean, if it could be avoided where possible, do it. But in those, in those um, organizations where people have to shower, staggered start times, staggered shower times, staggered use of the facilities, increased sanitation of those particular areas. Site attendance for workers, visitors, and contractors, obviously looking at the person's name, surname, company address, mobile number, ID number, et cetera, for tracking and tracing of people who are coming onto your site. Deliveries. Now, this again, in my mind, could be a high-risk activity where you're sending your people out to other sites where you don't know the effectiveness of their controls. And again, you should be looking at, at face shields, KN95, masks, sanitizers issued to the guys and very, very strict protocol. And they should keep a list of the people that they've come into contact with. And I've, I've put a, a thing in here for small businesses and waste management. And then there's a comprehensive section in here on emergency planning, what to do if a member of staff or a member of the public becomes unwell, what your protocol should be. What you should consider in terms of if, if an affected person has recently been to your workplace or what to do in terms of your workplace in terms of uh, an identified infection. It's like a lot of people don't understand if you, you've got to phone the um, NCID or the Department of Health. Um, yeah, who should you be phoning? Who should you be contacting? What do you need to do? You know, another thing that seems to be on the fore now is a lot of people are advertising these disinfectant room foggers. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I buy into the concept because if somebody, if I've been touching an environment, you know, you've got the room fogger and it dissipates all the sanitized stuff onto the tabletop, but what about underneath the lamp and underneath the book and, and everything else? So again, I think elbow grease and surface disinfectant is going to be your kind of go-to uh, concept there. So, and again, in here, we just um, put in an example of a very simple risk assessment in the, in the COVID plan. And after that, we've looked at a, a, a COVID uh, questionnaire and then also just some of the sectoral guidelines and templates. So, yeah, right, um, that's around about it. That is an overview of our COVID prevention protocol or the workplace plan, as you kind of correctly said, um, that would be required by any employer and also an example of a COVID risk assessment. So if there's anybody out there that would like to ask some questions, I'm gonna stop sharing. Please feel free to ask some questions if um, anybody's interested. Well, while we're waiting for questions, um, perhaps there's, there's one issue I'd like to highlight. Um, have a look at the chat there, Nick. Yeah, I got it. Uh, is that the, the regulations and the um, requirements in terms of the workplace plan require the employer to identify 
uh, people with comorbidities and people over 60, and then to take appropriate measures to deal with those comorbidities and with people who are over 60. And some people have just read that without thinking it through and have taken the view that that means that people who have any comorbidity could include hypertension, could include diabetes, could include asthma. And, and, and I, I challenge you to throw a stick into a crowd and not hit three people with, with mm. those comorbidities. Um, it means that they can't work. And that's not the case. What it does mean is that each employer is going to have to undertake some kind of questionnaire to determine whether an individual has comorbidities and then once the comorbidities have been identified to obtain a certificate from a an occupational health practitioner or a doctor and my recommendation is not that person's gp yeah um, to yeah. determine whether they are fit to work because we needed to be need to be guided by that uh, employers unless they're hospitals um not are not medical experts and then not to make those determinations, doctors. Um, also, as, part, as far as people over 60 is concerned, um, being over 60, you might be healthier than, than half the 23-year-olds in your organization. Correct. It depends. What the regulations require is a list. So what I've been recommending to my clients is that a questionnaire be circulated um, where the employees afforded the opportunity to identify which of the identified comorbidities listed by the World Health Organization in respect of COVID, they may have. And then that allows that smaller group to be contacted and engaged with to determine what the appropriate measures may be. They may include working at home. They may include increased social distancing or, or higher rates of PPE. It really depends on the facts. So um, those are all considerations. What we, what we do have to do is actually have the plan in place before the enterprise reopens. So right. if, and, and look, the rumor mill is running, so we don't know when it's going to happen, but let's assume that KZN opens for business at level three on the 1st of June. Already we have business going to work anyway. The regulations require that the workplace plans be in place before commencement of operations. So there really is is an obligation on employers to have those workplace plans ready now so that when the doors open they're ready to roll yep. and and the complexity of those workplace plans is going to determine is going to be determined more accurately by the size of the enterprise a small 100%. medium or large enterprise and in and in different industries it's going to require different kinds of plans um i'm delighted that you prepared such a comprehensive one. I think yours is probably going to be the gold standard. Um, and it's, it's really comprehensive, it's impressive. Um, somebody who, who runs a, a tea shop on the corner with three employees may not require quite as much, although they Correct. have eye contact all the time. And, and really they'd need to have a, a very clear understanding of how they're going to mitigate that. But very helpful. Sure. So something I'd draw your attention right, to. Questions? Yeah. Sorry, carry on. Something yeah. I draw your attention to is the the directive requires any organization with more than 300 employees to submit their workplace plan to the uh, regional inspector for approval. It has to be considered by the Health and Safety Committee and it needs to be approved if they're that size organization. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, what I, I can definitely tell you that, you know, I deal with quite a few brokers and smaller, call it SMME businesses. Um, and I can categorically state that they're not even aware that this assessment needs to, to happen and sure. that certain risk measures need to be put in place. Um, so, you know, specifically for me, that was very helpful to go through this um, understanding and actually seeing how you've uh, derived the risk register um, that that one should consider for returning your workforce back to to the offices for those who can. Thanks, John. I much appreciate it. Lovely. Great. Any any other questions, um, Linda? Do you have any questions from from a school perspective? 
Thank you, Raymond. Sorry, I came in a bit late. I was in a no management problem. meeting, so we finished early. Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think a school is a very unique organization, um, and we, being a high school, I think it's easier for us, but obviously concerns are for the primary schools more so than the high schools. But um, no, I don't have any questions because I'm not quite sure what you've just discussed thus okay. far, but just to say that I'm I'm so grateful to you, and I think I need to say that this platform for being of great help at, at our school. Thank you very much. It is appreciated. Linda, if you want, um, we've just finished developing the COVID workplace plan for Thomas Moore. So I've, I've got that as a, an example. I'm more than happy to send through some of the key headers to you for some of the things that you need to consider for your organization. And, uh, and an example of the risk assessment, if you'd like something to calibrate against. Oh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Raymond has very kindly offered to collate a document for us. Cool. So perhaps if you could send it directly to him. Will do, with pleasure. Right. We've, we've got big guns on our team too, so very, very grateful. And I think uh, Raymond, would. we've sent a couple of things to him, so perhaps he will draft a, a document that we could um, circulate to many schools. So thank you very much for that. Excellent. Well, that, there'll be a... I just a want to say on record that... Sorry. Yeah, fantastic. I just want to say on record, my guns are not as big as Nick's are. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So there'll, there'll be a copy of this recording that will be available on YouTube. I'm sure that uh, Tyler will make it available to um, any of the interested parties. Uh, it'll be available on our social media and our website as well. But just thanks to everybody for making the time. If you have any questions, you know how to get hold of myself and Raymond. And um, yeah, I just I hope all of you guys stay safe. And I'm trusting that things will start opening up again soon for everybody. Lovely. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the time. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, so you guys. Okay, bye, bye, then. Cheers, eh? Bye. Thanks, Nick. Bye.